Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. Today, we're talking about pre- and postnatal fitness. My guest is a former NBA dancer who has also performed in commercials and off-Broadway theater. Her dance career sparked her love for fitness, where she now holds several certifications. She helped develop programs for Jukari, the Fit to Fly workout collaboration between Reebok and Cirque du Soleil. Embracing motherhood created a passion that drove her to become a pre- and postnatal exercise specialist. She's developed various specialized workouts for women in every phase of pregnancy and postpartum. Sarah Haley, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, First of all, I I took my son, I remember when I took him to his first uh, Lakers game, and uh, he was so excited about going to a basketball game. Uh, the first thing that bothered him is that our tickets were in the middle of the theater, not like really close down. He's like, when are we going to go down and talk to them? I was like, we're not going to go down and talk to them. (laughs) Um, and then he was fascinated by the whole game. He watched it. He drank root beer. He ate peanuts and, um, he was asking some questions, this and that. And then when the game was over, my wife waited up because it was late and we, we came home and she said, how was the game? And he said, it. You know, how come every single time the Laker girls came out, they had different outfits on? (laughs) I was like, he didn't say a word about the Laker girls over there. I was like, did you notice that there was also a basketball game going on? (laughs) <laughs> that means they were doing their job right. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they definitely drew his attention. Hilarious. Uh, very entertaining. So your background, you started in dance. Yeah, I moved to New York City to dance, and my favorite job actually was dancing for the NBA. Uh, my dad was a basketball college player. I mean, oh, wow. like you know, small school. But I moved to New York and the I danced for the New Jersey Nets, who are now the Brooklyn Nets. And I didn't even know they became Brooklyn Nets. Yes, they are now the Brooklyn Nets. That doesn't sound nearly as cool as New Jersey Nets. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and I auditioned for them first because their audition was up before the New York City Knicks. And this is 2002, 2003 season. And I, so I made the nets and I called my dad and I was like, but dad, I want to dance in Madison Square Garden. Aww. And as a basketball fan, he was, the nets were very good that year. They, they were actually in the finals with the Lakers that year. So it was a great oh, season wow. to dance for them. But he was like, Sarah, if you want to watch good basketball, <laughs> this is what he was concerned about, right? <laughs> if you want to watch good basketball, don't you dare go dance for the Knicks because oh, they really? were not good at they that time. Oh. But I mean, every little girl's dream is to be, uh, I mean, if you're, th- if you're in the dance team world, World is to be uh, in Madison Square Garden. Sure. I mean, who or anyone, probably think, any entertainer, yeah, no period, matter what right? you do, the uh, to be in Madison Square Garden. But I will tell you, it was a great year for basketball, and we did not beat the Lakers that year, but uh-huh. we were in the finals with them. So that's why you moved to Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, forget that. <laughs> I'm going with the winning no, team. No, I moved to Los Angeles uh, actually the year I got pregnant with my oldest son. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. For something specific? Um, no. My husband and I had been, we lived in New Jersey, and then we moved to New York New York City. We'd been in New York City for six years, uh, 10 years on the East Coast, period. And, you know, once we got pregnant, we were like, you know what? If we don't leave New York now, we'll probably never leave. Mm. And we just wanted to try something different. I'll be honest, we thought we would go back. Sometimes we still think we'd go back. Yeah. But uh, it was such a great lifestyle change for raising a family. We live in Santa Monica, and it's great. That's amazing. I grew up in New York City, and... Um <laughs> you know, I loved it growing up there, but I can't imagine raising a family there. And I feel exactly the same yeah. way. Both of us do. Well, probably Although we would go back to New Jersey in a heartbeat, which people who don't know New Jersey, I know that sounds insane, but it is such a beautiful place to live and it is it's close enough Garden to New York State. City. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm probably offending a lot of listeners on the East Coast, but um, I would truly love growing up there. But it, there's just over here, there's so much more space. And like, if you want to see trees, you don't have to go to the park. They're well, just there. And, and, and you can be outside. 350 days at yeah. least a year. It's a whole different. It's a whole different world. Um, fitness. So you became like a fit, fitness guru. I would almost say. So I started teaching fitness classes to support me as a dancer. So when I wasn't in, when I didn't have a gig, I would teach fitness classes that opposed to like maybe your standard waitressing job. Right. And um, and I actually got really into it because of my. Because of Dancing on the Nets, a lot of the girls who I worked with, including my boss, um, the choreographer, he taught fitness too. And uh, so it became a great way to stay in shape Mm -hmm. and it became a 
you know, a really fun job. You're kind of performing when you're teaching class. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and you can make a full-time living in New York City doing it because there's so many gyms. So I was teaching, I mean, sometimes like 20, 25 classes a week, which wow. I don't necessarily recommend. Like looking yeah. back, I'm like, that's <laughs> way overtraining. It's a lot. But uh, – it was such a good transition for me, and my husband kind of called me out on it. Well, two things happened. One, I got a job offer from Reebok, mm-hmm. which really, it, they in so many ways set me up for everything I do now. And they were partnering with Cirque du Soleil at the time, as you read in the bio. Yeah. And it was such a great combo for me because it was dance and theater, Cirque du Soleil. Oh, it's your two things. With fitness, yeah. Reebok. And so I was kind of a, just a great fit at that time for them. You were a shoe-in. I, uh, See yeah. what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> well, and at the time, they, were, they had built a team of 25 women, and then it kind of narrowed down to – there were really four of us that – stayed on the team and the joke always was that Cirque liked me because I looked like a Cirque ar- artist oh. I mean I'm, f- I'm barely 5'1 so I look like this you know, <laughs> little person that belongs in their shows uh, and Those workouts but I loved it I understood their lifestyle very fun they are they're amazing and my job is, as part of Reebok was to go to Montreal into their headquarters look at all the crazy amazing stuff that they do and then say what in this can we make into a workout that your standard Joe is able to do in the yeah. gym. Uh, and so that's how we created the workouts. But it, so that became such a full-time job. I was doing so many different things for Reebok. I was working on that partnership with Cirque du Soleil. I was doing all their media uh, with the news. I was training celebrities for them. I was doing photo shoots. I mean, anything that you can imagine you would do for a brand, mm-hmm. uh, that's what I did for Reebok. And then my husband also just kind of called me out on it. He was like, Sarah, you are so much happier doing this fitness stuff than you are when you're grinding the audition, you know, grinding at auditions. And auditions don't look fun. No, they're not. They're not. Performing is amazing and it's wonderful. But I, I can't say I was one of those dancer actors that was fond of the audition process. Right. Uh, so it's kind of the combo of those things that made me make that full-time transition into fitness. Mm-hmm. And then prenatal fitness came when you had your first? Uh, No, I actually got certified ahead of time. I had started working for uh, a different trainer. I had worked for her company. And I was the only one that had a certification in pre- and postnatal exercise. I had just gotten it because it seemed like the right thing to do if I was going to be training women. And then also secretly, I knew that I would want to work out when I was pregnant, and I mm-hmm. wanted to do that safely as well. So is that what the certification was about? Like, There's a basic – so when I say a certification, there was like a one-day – the original certification I took. And I actually advise any female trainer, instructor, even just a fitness fanatic that wants mm-hmm. to work out safely during their pregnancy. You could just go do like a one-day – and they teach you like the basics – it's not necessarily what I would recommend if you want to become a specialist like I am now, but anybody can do that and learn like the basic do's and don'ts. Right. And that was what I had done prior to having my own kids. Sure. But nobody else even had that. So I ended up getting all the pregnant clients and all the postpartum clients, and I loved it. I mm-hmm. loved it because these women, they needed me. They needed my expertise. They needed the camaraderie of being with women working out. They needed somebody that would just listen to them. I mean, mm-hmm. we always joke that when you're a trainer, you're also a therapist. Yeah. And I I love that. I mean, I already knew I wanted to be a mom, um, even though I'm not a kid person. <laughs> I mean, now I am, I guess. But uh, I just – and I loved being around those women. I love being around moms. I still do. So – once I became pregnant myself, that's when I really dove into, you know, a, a specialist. And that that does take more work and more certifications. It almost sort of feels like when I got started in prenatal chiropractic, at first it was like, how do you do chiropractic safely on someone who's pregnant? But then it kind of grows much more deeply into how to use chiropractic for the pregnancy itself. Yeah, And knowing the specifics for the individual, right? I mean, in the general one, it's like – and that's why, unfortunately, I always say to people, they'll say to me, oh, my trainer, they're certified. But they're doing what you're talking about. It's just like a basic do's or don'ts. and you. It's essentially what not to do. What not to do. And so then sometimes they either go one way or the other. They either say, that's garbage. I know my client and they just don't really give them what they need or they go – to such the extreme where it's like, oh, I don't want them to do anything, and then the client's bored, right? right? So when you really get certified, you do learn, like you're saying, to look at each person individually, each pregnancy. Are they high risk? Are they not? I mean, there's so many factors. The various stages of pregnancy. Exactly. And, and levels of fitness. And postpartum recovery, which I think 
honestly, is when you need to be even more careful. So let's talk about them both. Like when you're when you're planning, because oh, a lot of our patients and uh, they come in, um, some of them are, are are fit and regularly active to begin with, and then they get pregnant. For the most part, they kind of continue what they're doing with some modifications. Um, but sometimes people come into pregnancy, they haven't worked out in a really long time or ever sometimes, uh, and then they now that they're pregnant, they are looking to get more healthy. They're looking to get the oxygen and blood flow. The doctor says, hey, you got to be careful with your sugar and things like that. If someone's starting to work out during pregnancy, though, what they often are afraid of is what can I do and what can I do and how do I, you know, how do I custom tailor my workouts to the pregnancy? They become fearful to do workouts. So we need sort of guidelines and experts to sort of explain how to work out when you're pregnant, what you can and can't do, and what, what the ideal things are to do and not do. Where does somebody get started? Totally understandable. Uh, so first of all, they're not crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that is the way you should be thinking. Uh, and you know, research used to say, do what's moderate for you. So then a person who hasn't been doing anything says, well, does that mean I can't do anything at all? No. It just means that you need to work slower and you need to be more mindful because your body isn't necessarily used to doing some of these things, right? Uh, your doctor is probably going to say you can walk, you can swim, and you can do pre- and postnatal exercise classes, Okay. Uh, which is all right and fine and good. The things I don't want them to be afraid of, which I think is going to be what they are afraid of, you can sweat. You can sweat. You can breathe hard. Mm-hmm. You don't want to go breathless. You don't want to lose your breath. You want to be able to talk out loud. Does that mean you can be breathy talking out loud? Yeah, but you don't want to lose your breath. I will say if somebody were to call you on the phone and while you're working out and you were to answer, would they be like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Like, what's going on? Or they might just know you're working out. They right, catch you on the treadmill. Right. And so that's what I want you so – I, I like to cardio, use the talk test. Like if you're doing cardio. Right. If you're doing stuff? cardio, I want you to use the talk test. Can you talk out loud to somebody? If the answer is yes, I think you are in a good place Mm -hmm. because it is called working out. It's not called standing still. Yeah. It's called working out. Um, If you're weight training, yes, do I want you to start a little bit lighter? Well, before we get to weight training, what are are some different types of cardio? Because you just mentioned basic like – what did you say? Walking, Walking, swimming? Walking, swimming, and Mm -hmm. pre- and postnatal yoga is is what I generally hear that the doctors recommend. But what about – there's so many other forms of cardio. There are so many other forms of cardio. Can you You do dance and – Yes. You can. Yes. Yes, you can do these things. But again, you have to be mindful. Now, let me use myself as an example because these same rules apply to – like your super athlete. Okay. And and there are some things that we can get into later too that the super athlete I like needs to be more conscious of. I to super athlete. Right. I think there's a lot of things that they have in common. <laughs> they both inspire me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I mean the super athlete needs to keep these same rules, you know. They can probably do a lot more because it's going to take a lot more for them to get breathless. Out of breath. Yeah. But they still need to apply that rule to them. Um what else can they do? You can you can be on the elliptical. Uh, you can dance. Uh, you can do you can do a lot of group exercise classes, but you need to let your instructor right. know. Cycling is a great thing that you can sometimes do like all the way through. Or, yeah, spinning or, on a bike, taking a cycling class. All that you have to do is obviously let your instructor know for one, but you have to raise the seat up. You have to I mean, uh, you have to raise the handlebars up. So that you're not, you know, crushing hunched over. Yeah. You're not crushing the belly. Exactly. Uh, Can I do Jakari? No, I would not have recommended Jakari. In fact, when we did some media for Jakari, uh, it's not actually it's not even in the clubs anymore because the relationship between Reebok and Cirque du Soleil is no longer. Oh. But funny that you say that because when the program launched and I did media for them, I was actually pregnant with my oldest. Oh, really? <laughs> and I had to talk the entire workout because they didn't want the liability. Uh-huh. Um. Did I teach the class? Yes, but I talked most of it when I did it. A lot of it was done with a bar. Yeah. So actually, this is a a great thing to not recommend to people, uh, although CrossFit instructors will disagree with me. But a lot of it was using your upper body to do pull-up type movements. Okay. Pull-up type movements recruit your core muscles ridiculously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of core work that people don't realize. So that's why I would say you would really need to modify that exercise. Um, it's, I mean, this is a whole, whole other thing that I could talk all day about, but it's the, a lot of the core work is what we want to be really conscious of, um, how much we're recruiting our core, but the cardio, yes. Steps. 
steps. Yes. You can okay, run up and down okay. The steps. Okay, no? so let's let's talk about the steps because this will apply to a lot of things. I do want everyone to be conscious any pregnant person no matter what fitness level, to be conscious of doing exercises that put you at risk for falling. Okay. Now, I have been on a step for you know, almost 20 years now. I've been working on and off of a step because okay. I've taught step aerobics, right? Yeah. Um, I've jumped for 30 years of my life because I used to be a dancer. So mm-hmm. I know how to land on my feet safely. Mm-hmm. Now, somebody who has not done those things prior to pregnancy, right. probably not a good idea. You're, you are probably at risk for falling off a step. Um, you are probably at risk for not landing properly on your feet and thus too much impact on your pelvic floor, mm-hmm. right? But you could look at a um, professional skier. Plenty of them ski pregnant. Yeah, Should so I we, do that? No, <laughs> I can barely make it down a bunny hill. We have an episode of the podcast called uh, The Taboos of Pregnancy, and our guest was Dr. Jake Goldberg, ob and he, he said the same thing. He said, you know, people ask him if I can ski. Well, if you've been skiing since you're two— and you ski regularly, then you probably have better balanced skiing than I have walking. Yeah. So, you know, if you feel confident and safe that you're not going to fall. Then right. But could somebody else run into you? Yeah. Well, this, you could say the same with driving. True. Really. Very mm-hmm. true. Very true. Um, so um, and I the think... same thing in a, in a group fitness class. Like, are they maybe going to push you? And this is this is, this is is why I think the workouts that I produce and put out for pregnant women are great. They are taking a lot of of the things that you might do in a typical group fitness class, and you're working at a slightly slower pace. It's not necessarily Hmm. less challenging, but if you're in a class where everybody's moving to a beat, like a dance class, like a step class, which there aren't many of anymore, like a kickboxing class, um, you are moving way too fast for somebody in their second or third trimester to safely keep up with. I don't care how tall you are or how big or small you are. Mm-hmm. It's just just going to be too fast. And specifically with, with the boxing or the kickboxing, there's too much twisting. Mm-hmm. So, like, I have new workouts coming out in about a month for pregnancy, and I have a boxing modified workout where we move the arms and legs like you would in a kickboxing class, but we take out all the twisting. Mm. So and it's at a much slower pace. Yeah. So you still sweat. You still sweat. You still burn. You still work all the muscles that you would in that, but we take out the twisting so that we are respecting uh, the abdominals and what they need to do mm-hmm. to you know, let your baby grow in a safe way and still be intact for your postpartum recovery. Uh, and we also keep uh, you mindful of how fast your heart is beating. <laughs> Well, it seems logical. Um, we Before we go to a break, because when we come back, I want to talk a lot more about postpartum okay. and what happens afterwards. Uh, we talked a little bit about cardio for pregnancy, and then you were going to talk about weight training a little bit. Yes. Now, there used to be a rumor. I haven't heard it much in like the past year, but that pregnant women shouldn't lift above X amount of pounds, right? You shouldn't lift more than five pound weights, mm-hmm. which makes me insane because – This baby is going to come out really soon. Uh And, yeah, maybe there's a good percentage of women who have a five-pound baby. I personally have all babies that are eight pounds and over. So, first of all, I want to be able to lift that baby safely. Second of all, I want to be able to lift all the things that come along with it. Yeah. And that baby is going to just start growing and growing. Yeah, and you're going to put it in a car seat and you got to lug the car seat in and out. Yeah, the car seat is 97 pounds. Yes, that is not fun to lift. (laughs) Now, granted, you aren't going to lift it in the first probably six to eight weeks of your postpartum recovery anyway, Mm -hmm. depending on your doctor or midwife. But... You don't want to put those muscles to sleep for nine months and then all of a sudden be like, all right, I'm expected to do all this because that's how you're going to throw out your back. Um, That's, you know, you're that's going to take you a lot longer to get those muscles back. So we want to keep those muscles alive and working. So depending on the muscle group we're looking at, you may be using more than five pounds of weight. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, it's going to differ during your pregnancy, differ during your trimesters. Sure. I mean, I see everything from people lifting five pounds or less to even powerlifting during pregnancy. Right. And... I'm not a huge You're not fan. The big fan of power I'm not a huge fan of the <laughs> And let, let me tell you exactly why. I, I I would love to take a survey. I always say this. I would love to take a survey of how many of those power lifters are on their first pregnancy where their pelvic floor is just, just like super ah, strong. The pelvic floor you're worried about. Yeah, I'm worried about their pelvic floor because it might be fine now, like during that first pregnancy. I guarantee you they'll get into if they have any more children after that. And that pelvic floor just won't be what it once was before pushing a child out or yeah. just carrying a baby for nine months. And uh, that's where they're going to run into problems. It's mm-hmm. just – Well, that's why I yeah. don't lift any weights. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> what about – I've heard not to lift over your head. Is that a rumor? Is that something – No, if you – no, you can lift over your head. But what you want to be conscious of 
is are you flaring the rib cage? Are, is, you know, a lot of times when people go overhead, they're not able to keep their core engaged, mm-hmm. meaning they're not able to keep their shoulders down, their rib cage closed. And I mean, especially your rib cage closed when you are, you know, in your third trimester and that baby is already is it like so ever big. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not all. No, it's it, it has to because your abdominals are separating. Your linea alba is, is you know stretching, and everything is making room for that baby. Uh, so there's two theories, right? There's one, is it counterintuitive to be trying to close what's naturally trying to happen in your body? Uh, but also we don't want to make it worse so that when you get to your postpartum recovery and you're six months out, and it sounds like we'll talk about this after the break, Mm -hmm. so a little preview and you're saying, why do I look pregnant still? And I'm not. Yeah. Who, with a teaser like that, who wouldn't come back after the break? (laughs) Uh, in your workouts, when you're coaching people who are pregnant, are there things that you do during the pregnancy to specifically prepare for the physical marathon of labor and vaginal birth and also separately for someone who's preparing for a cesarean birth? Are there things that you do to help get them ready? Totally. And when, when we talk about cardio, that's why cardio is so important endurance. too. You need to have that endurance. I mean, you right. don't know how long this labor is going to last. Right. Uh, specifically for that, yes, your pelvic floor muscles, not only being able to, you know, do a Kegel, but being able to release a Kegel Mm -hmm. and it's the contraction and the release that are going to allow you to do that. Um, I think I'm doing one right now. (laughs) I mean, that's the, that's the glory (laughs) of Kegels. You can do them anywhere. Anywhere. Nobody knows. Exactly. (laughs) But the same thing with a lot of it is going to be what core exercises are you doing? Which core exercises are you not doing to really have the best core engagement, contraction, and space to be able to recover properly and to be able to do what you need to do to breathe and push out a baby. Is that – so is that – because you have online programs. I do, and I have 12 new pregnancy workouts coming out in about a month. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. And so these are things that people can do at home? home? Yes. Oh, oh, they're specifically for They're meant home. to do it at home. Yeah, and I have I a good percentage really of friends too that will that maybe if even if you aren't a home workout person, you know, take the exercises that you like from the programs and do them in the gym. I have a bunch of people I know who've done that. But I also think there's people who live in areas where they can't get to a gym or maybe they already have one or two kids and they're trying to work out and the time management doesn't allow for a gym. So it's great to be able to bring you into our home. Or you get to a certain point in your pregnancy and you don't want to go in a gym because you don't want to hear anybody ask you for the third time if you're having triplets. So if (laughs) I do your workouts, will I be able to dance like a Brooklyn Nets girl? (laughs) No. No, I like to, I'm going to keep it as New Jersey Nets in my head. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Okay. It is. That's what my heart tells me um will you there actually is a dance program there is a dance program and and my friends who have tried the workouts say that it's their favorite even the non-dancers hmm. because who doesn't like to rub a baby belly while they're dancing mm, no, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good question uh all right let's go ahead and take a break and we are going to come right back with sarah haley on the informed pregnancy podcast <laughs> If you use formula, listen up. For a limited time, our U.S. listeners can get a free product that may help your formula-fed child in a big way. Sometimes kids on formula experience eczema, reflux, constipation, or other tummy troubles. Desperate to help, parents transition through several baby formulas and still sometimes can't find a solution. The question is, could cow's milk formula be the trigger? You see, goat milk proteins form a gentler curd in the tummy and appear to digest in a similar way to breast milk and quicker than cow milk protein. As a result, goat milk formula may be a solution for some children with troubles associated with cow's milk. Cabrita is a naturally easy-to-digest formula that starts with gentle goat's milk. For a limited time, Cabrita is offering our U.S.-based listeners a free tin of formula. Here's how you get yours. Follow Cabrita on social media at Hello Cabrita. That's Hello, K-A-B-R-I-T-A. DM them my last name, Berlin, along with your email address. They'll reach out to get your shipping details and then send you a free tin to try with your child. The answer you've been looking for may be Cabrita's naturally easy-to-digest goat milk formula, Find out by getting your free tin today. (music) 
Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. L.A. Berlin, and we're continuing our discussion about pre- and postnatal fitness with our guest, Sarah Haley. Welcome back. <laughs> so let's talk about postpartum. Uh, postpartum's tough because uh, you've, you've gone through this whole pregnancy, and then you have a baby somehow, some way. Sometimes it's uh, vaginal, sometimes it's cesarean, sometimes it starts off vaginal, ends up cesarean. Either way, it's a workout, and um, it leaves you caring for a new human which is uh, has a lot of learning curve built into it. Overwhelming, to it, say the least. Yeah, sure, yeah. overwhelming. It's almost like I think that a lot of people go through pregnancy feeling like they just have to, you know, get, get through the pregnancy and get through the birth, and then you can just go to Disneyland. But it sort of like really starts once the baby comes out. Yeah, and that's why I say I think postpartum and not just in terms of fitness, in terms of everything, is harder than the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And for fitness... It specifically is because you've had the baby. You're no longer pregnant. And I think a lot of women, we're so kind to ourselves when we're pregnant. We're so lenient with ourselves. Uh, We give ourselves so much grace, right? I think whether – or at least I hope – I hope that my pregnant mom is out there. I hope that you do. I know I do. Uh, I'm like, okay, I didn't want to work out today. Okay, that's fine. All right, I wanted french fries today. Okay, that's fine. And, you know, th- not every day is like that. Mm. <laughs> then we're in trouble. I was just thinking, I give myself a lot of grace. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's when we, but that's when we get in trouble, right? I mean, if you're, showing, if you're doing that to yourself every day. But I think we listen to our bodies more when we're pregnant because it's not just about us. It's about the baby. And, and so we're trying to be mindful of that. And then the baby comes out and you're like, all right. And I think especially first time moms, right? You're like, all right, let me just get back to being me. Mm-hmm. And let me get back to the workouts I was doing and back to the way I was eating and back to the way I was sleeping. And none of that happens mm-hmm. uh, unless you have like maybe a million people helping you, right? right? Which um, most of us don't. No, and which, which, but which is why we look to celebrities sometimes and we're like, well, they did it. Why can't I do it? Mm-hmm. Well, they have a million people helping them yeah, that they're paying story. to help them. And part of their job is to like magically look like they didn't have a baby. That's uh, true. Some, so, I mean, a lot of our, our patients are in that boat in entertainment and they sometimes need to be back on screen three weeks right. after that. Maybe. And so they have somebody to cook for them and they have somebody to watch their kids and they have their trainer and they have all these people which wonderful if you can do that. The majority of us can't. Mm-hmm. And I know personally even, I remember having my oldest and just being like, okay, well, I can do this stuff now and not being as intuitive as I was when I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. So one of my most watched, I think it is the most watched YouTube videos that I have out are the top five postpartum mistakes. And if Ooh. you want to link to that, that yeah. women make in terms of exercise. Okay. And... Two of them. I'll give you two out of the five. Oh, teaser. Uh, <laughs> the teaser. Uh, but, there, but you'll get where I'm going with this, uh, is going back too soon. Okay. okay. So, and I get so many emails about this. Hey, Sarah, my doctor and my wid- midwife said that I can't do anything for another two weeks, but what can I do? Mm-hmm. Uh, Listen yeah. to your doctor <laughs> or midwife, idea. or you will regret it. Right. Uh, you will regret it because your pelvic floor will not have healed. Uh, your stitches may not have healed. Your muscles may not have healed. I mean, there's so many things that guess what? Your doctor or midwife. Might be onto something. Yes. And they saw the birth. They saw it all happen. Mm -hmm. They're seeing what's going on in there during your checkup. So you got, I mean, you got to listen to them. So that's number one is they go back too soon. And everybody says, well, what is that usually? Typically... I mean, I have never heard – I mean, I've, I've, I've heard of people doing it, but I've never heard of a doctor recommending anything before four weeks. Mm-hmm. And that's usually a vaginal birth. With a C-section, we're looking at usually six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, I know after I just had my – I had my third nine months ago, and my doctor gave me six weeks, and that was for a vaginal delivery. So it's, it's all across the board. It seems like six weeks is pretty typical. Six weeks, I think, is really good. Does, six, does it mean you can't move for six weeks? No. Right. So that's the question. Not not like how do I beat the system, but what right. can I do during the – six weeks is a long time. Yeah. So you know? I, again, I'm going to say talk to your doctor or midwife. And if you are a crazy person, which I – totally admit I am one of these, right? Because I love to move my body. Mm -hmm. You need to be very specific about what you need them to tell you to do. So I had an amazing doctor for my past two pregnancies or past two deliveries. And she like gave me specifics. Sarah, I don't want you to lift anything heavier than the baby for the first two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want you to push a stroller for the first four weeks. And if that's, if you know you are a mover and a shaker and you want to like get back doing a mile walk each day, 
tell your OBGYN or your midwife that. I want I want to start walking, you know, a mile. When do you think I'll be okay to do that? Ask for those specifics. Again, most people are going to say within maybe two to four weeks you can start doing some, you know, more serious walking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but definitely no weight training before those four to six weeks. Right. Uh, you know, definitely no intense cardio. And then even then, you all, think if you had a major injury and how you would go back to healing that injury. You wouldn't just go back into your 5 to 10K run, mm. right? If you had hurt <laughs> your knee and you had knee surgery, you wouldn't do that. Right. Right? I mean, unless you want to have that injury back. And that's what, I mean, women will jump back in and they're like, why am I still peeing myself? Well, you didn't allow those pelvic floor muscles to recover gradually. Right. We have a, a, also an episode on pelvic floor health where we kind of really go into what are the pelvic floor muscles? How do they work? What happens when they get overstretched or even when they get too tight? So it's good for, I think, for people to listen to that episode to understand Please. what you're talking about. Do you talk about. about prolapse in it too? Uh, mm, I think we touched on prolapse. We didn't get yeah. into it too deeply. But you, but that's you can something, talk about so it that's here. something, and I, and I hate to say this to scare anyone, but... It's definitely something we don't talk about enough. It's definitely something that happens far more often than we talk about. So there's three types of prolapse. So uh, there is a uterine, a bowel, and a bladder prolapse. So what this means is they've literally dropped down into the vaginal area, and sometimes it will come out. So you may see something. So if you see something so you can see or your feel something, you out. can see your bladder come out. I mean, if you Google it, you'll see more than you ever wanted to see. Right, yeah. uh, but just know that that's a very severe case. Right. Most oftentimes, it's just that it's dropped down lower. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you feel it. So you feel it. And that's, why, and that's oftentimes why we are leaking. It's mm-hmm. not just, oh, you didn't do enough Kegels. It's your bladder has now moved. So what we don't want to have happen is it for it to come out. Mm-hmm. And what I find a lot of new moms will say is – Oh, but I had a baby. I just thought it was supposed to feel like that. Ooh. It's not supposed to feel like anything. It's You are eventually supposed to feel close, if not how you did before you had the baby. Eventually, right? Eventually. Mm-hmm. That could be a year out. That could be five years out. That could be three months out. I, mean, I we... still don't feel like I felt before I had the <laughs> no, baby. <laughs> no, no. And I, but I mean in, in, in your vaginal area. Well, I certainly like, that's, don't feel that way. That's what we're talking about in this, in, <laughs> oh, in this instance. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Yes. Um, you should get pretty close to how you felt before. and But I think a lot of us just say, oh, but we, I had a baby. I mean, I remember talking to a, an older friend, um, my aunt, not to call you out. But, <laughs> and she was like, oh, Sarah, we all pee ourselves. And I was like, mm, hmm. I don't know about that. You know, she's a marathon runner. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's right. I don't think we all should have to be peeing ourselves while we're running. Right. So uh, – we need to be aware of that. And I would say if you're going to do anything in your postpartum recovery is ask your OBGYN or your midwife to check you for a prolapse mm-hmm. and to check for diastasis recti. Mm-hmm. Now, we'll – That's the separation right, of the Right, and that's the separation of the abdominals I talked about before. Uh, it's everybody – and keep so keep in mind. So diastasis recti, here, the, the quickest way to describe this. You have your six-pack abs that we all want. Sure I do. Three and three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen my six-pack abs uh-huh. in a while either, if that makes you feel better. Um, so you have three and three on each side. In the center is tissue called the linea alba. When the baby grows, that tissue is going to stretch and it's going to thin to allow the uterus to get bigger or allow the baby to grow. Okay? And is it going to happen in everybody? Yes, it has to. Mm-hmm. When it happens too much. That is when we call it a diastasis recti, and you can check yourself. And if you want to link to the video that I have where you oh, you got a video yourself. on the finger. Yeah, cut? so uh, we don't we don't want it to stretch too much. It's sort of like the drapes kind of separating, right? Right. And then there's nothing holding the right. contents in. Right, and that's in why it. in a postpartum recovery, if you're like, I still look pregnant, and I'm not. You're not just bloated. Mm-hmm. It's that your abdominals are now in a different place, and we need to bring them back are together. Pushing through that yes. gap, right? And a lot, a lot of times. So if you see anything poke out, which I get, I get pictures sent to me a lot. And if you're seeing something actually poke out, it could be that you now have a hernia. Mm-hmm. That happens a lot in postpartum recovery too, especially when women are doing crunches and crunches and crunches that you should not do during pregnancy, definitely, but in your postpartum recovery either. Mm-hmm. 
but but I think more commonly, it just sort of looks a little triangular mm-hmm. where the edges of the of the right and left rectus don't line up flat. Yeah. But they sort of tent out like a pyramid. Right, we call it triangle. coning or doming, and you'll see it. And again, we can link to this video because I so I've had. Somebody said, Sarah, if you're going to specialize in pre and postnatal, we're going to give you all this stuff so you can experience it yourself. <laughs> so most of the stuff I talk about, oh, I have experienced. Oh, you've had these things. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I um, had a diastasis recti after my second mm-hmm. son. And it, there's a video. I'm pregnant with him. And you can see me lying down in my whole belly. Instead of being a soft, round, you know, baby bump, it's literally going into a cone, mm-hmm. coning shape. And I... So you can see what that looks like. So sometimes it can look like that during your pregnancy, and that's when you should definitely back out, back off on your core work. But a lot of times we see it in our postpartum recovery, especially early on. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so I don't have a very severe one from this last pregnancy at all, um, which I was – I wasn't too surprised because I had been so conservative with my core work this time around. But when I uh, popped that baby out this time, thank you, third pregnancy, (laughs) when I pushed her out in one push, I looked down because my doctor actually gave me the great uh, journey of pulling my baby out. Oh, you pulled your baby out? I got to pull her out this time. That's cool. It was my first baby girl, and I pulled her out, and then I saw my entire belly cone, and I was like, Uh. I just remember having the thought of, oh, man, this is going to be a rough recovery. But it wasn't. It was just a whole lot of extra skin and, you know, and a little bit of Because you just pulled Because I literally <laughs> had just pulled her out. But I'd never seen that before because I'd never had the chance to do that because right. I was, had been flat on my back for my boys. And for her, I was not. So anyway, that might be too much information. No, I think it's really cool that you got to pull <laughs> yeah, your baby out. It was pretty out. amazing. Uh, I think she was so excited for me that I was having a girl. I didn't know. And so, <laughs> oh, was it a um, surprise? It was. All my babies oh, were surprises. So cool. But this was especially – she was my, you know, hardest one to get pregnant with. And she was a girl. And oh, it sounds was, like so it was a girl. Super fun. Yeah. yeah, it was super fun. But my point being, when you see that coning and doming, it is a sign to you to be more mindful with the core work that you're doing. Uh, and I have a whole list of exercises I could give women to not do and then also to do. So to, to not do, to prevent? Uh, well, to prevent for one, but then also, it's, like I said, in this postpartum recovery, it's almost more important. There are still a whole bunch of exercises that you need to avoid. Right, because people see the diastasis and they think, oh, I need to strengthen my abs, and they do the rectus strengthening. Yes, and they'll do everything that you're not supposed to do, and I'll get these emails apart. that are like, Sarah, I've been doing everything that you're saying not to do. Yeah. Uh, and you and you can recover from it. That's that's the good news. Is it might take a little bit of time, and you might not get to do all the things that you're really wanting to do in terms of, you know, core work. But life will go on. Yeah, and you know, the, it comes in different severities. So depending on how how long it is and how wide it is, you know, it could take more or less work or more things that you have to do to fully repair it. But 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 they do they do recover. Um, let's talk about after the six weeks. Yeah. Now what can I do? Now, now I'll do a little shameless plug. I, I have a program called the Fourth Trimester Workout that I created after my second son, which I love that I did it then because I had experienced a diastasis recti. Oh, right. And I have myself in the video, and then I have two women behind me. One shows all the modifications for C-section recovery. Oh. And one shows all the modifications for diastasis recti recovery. Oh, how smart. Yes. Very clever. And so, and the other thing is I have a calendar because that's what everybody wants to know. When, especially those of us who are very scheduled people, type A personalities, they want to know when can I do these exercises? How often should I do them? And there's a calendar that guides you through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's say you're not doing my program. What can you do, mm-hmm. right? You need to wake up like you did with your, with your pregnancy each day and say, how do I feel today, for one. That's what I really so want you to do. Today, even a French in that six Friday weeks. or a workout day? Exactly, okay. exactly. I'm but, catching on. No, but how, I mean, how tired am I, right? I mean, you're a new mom. Was I up all night? And, and that's what I think sometimes, too, is we don't do in our postpartum recoveries, especially if we're really anxious about, you know, getting – Stronger after baby, because I don't like the tagline, get my pre-baby body back, because mm-hmm. it's forever different. Okay. It might get better. True. But it might it's, even it's be forever better. different. Yeah, it's yeah. just different. Uh, but if you want to get stronger after baby, sometimes sleep can be your best. Yeah. You know, you might need to skip those workouts and just sleep a little bit more, because um, I get that asked a lot, too. Like, I'm not getting enough rest. Uh, I'm breastfeeding all the time. The weight's not coming off. 
I'm doing, I feel like I'm doing all the right things. I'm eating good foods. I'm exercising. And I usually will say then, well, are you sleeping? And they're like, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be the game changer to losing that weight. Yeah. We see that so, a lot. Yeah. Um, um, so what can you do? Yes. you Are, are you going to start to strength train a little bit? Are you going to start to work on your cardio endurance again? Yes, you're going to do all those things, but you are going to pace yourself. Does does breastfeeding change things one way or the other? Uh, it's like the pregnancy. It's completely individual. I have heard of women who lose all their weight plus some when they're breastfeeding. I have women who are completely stagnant while they're breastfeeding. I have women who will gain weight during the weaning process or lose all their weight during the weaning process. It, you know, it's a, it's a complete it's variation. It's so different. It can be different pregnancy to pregnancy. Some people tell me, well, with my boys, it was different. With my girls, it was different. Uh, you know, the milk supply could be different each time. I mean, there's so many different things. But does breastfeeding require a little more calories? Yes. Can you – will you lose your milk supply because you are exercising? No, because you are over-exercising and not hydrating and eating enough calories? Possibly, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you just got to be on top of things. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you got to – it's not just that you have to know yourself. You have to know yourself every day. Today could be different than yesterday yeah. and different from tomorrow because there's so much that goes on during that, that postpartum phase that's not predictable. Yeah, and that's the hardest part is because you're not thinking about yourself. All of a sudden you have this new person and you're like – thinking about them all the time and what do they need. And then, I mean, that's why self-care is such a hot topic now, right? Especially among moms. Is, but you're not doing what you need to do for you. So you got to take a deep breath and figure out how can you make that happen, even if it's just a little bit each day. What about um, I, the biggest thing that I think people tell me postnatally is let's talk about after the six weeks still, whether it's even six months, is that time. Right. I'm Mm -hmm. just around the baby all the time. Whatever time I have goes into the baby. Are there things that I can do that are fitness wise, either with the baby, you know, or that don't take me away from the baby? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Again, I'll give you a couple of links to some different videos about how to do that. Like I actually show like a setup how you could do it with the baby near you. It's even even when they're a toddler. Right. And they're like moving all the time and how to how to make that work. Uh, Here's what the biggest, I think, takeaway would be, though is you're going to have to make use of that short period of time like you've never used it before. Mm. So when you're feeling like your body is intact and you can start to push a little harder, meaning go breathless, uh, you know, pick up some heavier weights, when you're ready to do that, I am going to recommend it because guess what? If you lift three-pound weights for the 10 minutes that you have to work out, do you think anything's going to happen? Do you think you're going to get stronger? Do you think that you're going to see more tone in those arms? Probably not. But if you can use those 10 minutes and start to pick up some weight that challenges you, if you can start to go breathless with those cardio intervals that you're doing, even if it is just, you know, marching in place really fast or walking up and down your steps in your house, Mm -hmm. but you're going to have to use that time more wisely. Really efficient. Yeah, so much more efficient. Uh, And that's why I think, again, I've learned to do that. I, I used to work in fitness full time. I'm actually with my kids more than anybody realizes. Uh, you know, this pre and postnatal is, you know, partly my passion project and partly what I do to stay sane as a mom. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. You know, you but to... I'm with my kids 75 to 90 percent of the time, depending on what kind of project I'm working on. That's really great. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about the virtual world that we live in. I'm I, I'm able to do that now. I mean, I have to set boundaries for sure, but. My point being, I know what that's like. I mean, probably more than anybody is I used to be in the gym as much as I wanted for however long I wanted. And now, especially now that I have three kids, if I get to the gym, I'm like, that was a treat. (laughs) So you just have to be so much more efficient. And it just means not when you when you have those 10 minutes, let's say the baby naps. Uh, I created a workout system that I have that's called Sweat Unlimited. I created it a year after I had my first son because I realized I would plan, like, I'm going to do, like, a 45-minute workout, and then he would wake up. Mm. And that 45-minute workout became a 15-minute workout. Yeah. Right? So how do I do that? And so that workout program has a 5-minute workout, a 15-minute, a 30-minute, uh, a 45. Oh, that's working. Yeah, so that you can kind of, you know, schedule Stop accordingly. And uh, 
And so you just have to push when you have the time and when you're ready for to make that step. Yeah. I mean, the efficiency is really key because I, it usually takes me 15 to 20 minutes just to convince myself to work out. But by that, with a newborn, by that point, you, you might have lost your window. Right. So, And to get it done earlier in the day, I would say that because I don't know about anybody listening out there, but it hits like it used to be five o'clock. It hits three o'clock when my <laughs> kids are getting home from when my oldest one's getting home from school. Your day and is I'm toast. like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm, there is no chance of me getting back out, you know, for a workout. So the sooner in the day that I can do it, the better. And it might mean waking up a half hour earlier. And and I don't. And I say that to my moms that are out of the water a little bit, like I'm. That which is not me right now. My husband's always like, if you want to get it in, <laughs> easy for the dad to say no offense. <laughs> If you want to get it in, how about, why don't you just get up in the morning and do it? And I'm like, really? Are you going to take care of when she's like, are you, are you going to get the bottle out and do that? Because my boob's right here, and that's a heck of a lot easier. And I'm savoring it. So they're only and – I, and I would say that to my moms out there too. I would say two things. One – and you've probably heard both of these things before, so I hate – I'm sorry if I'm annoying you. Never. But one, something is always better than nothing. Mm-hmm. So those 10 minutes that you did, you're never going to go to bed being like, I wish I hadn't done those squats for 10 minutes. Right. I mean, you might if you're sore, but you're never going to do that. Are you going to maybe look back and say, oh, man, I had that 15-minute gap and I, d- I didn't do anything. I was cleaning, which, you know, might make you feel better, <laughs> but it's not doing anything for you, right. for your health. Uh, and I'm the usually other thing searching I would say, through Netflix for what I'm going to watch right, next. Right, I'm not going to feel great about that. No, later. no. Uh, not when you think, oh, but I could have used it for you know a couple squats and some lunges and you know maybe some bicep curls. Well, which just does the do way something. you feel after that ten minutes versus wasting ten minutes. Right, it, time, and all of it does add up. Time is really interesting because when. I was in chiropractic school. You start studying for boards, and as it gets closer, you study more nights a week, and eventually you're studying six or seven nights a week for three to four hours a night. So then you take the boards, and you should have like 24 hours a week extra now, and you start planning all the things you're going to do with your 24 hours a week extra that you haven't been able to get done or that's been on your waiting list. And then all of a sudden, within a two-week period of time, it doesn't feel like you have any time anymore. But you should have 20 hours a week extra. So time is a funny thing. So it, it's the efficiency that really, I think, makes a huge difference. You know, you're saying some great things because I, I work with postnatal women every day. And, and these are the things that they struggle with. It's like, I don't have time. or but, but to check in with yourself every day and say, hey, did I get enough sleep? Do I have enough nutrition? Can I work out today? And then if the answer is yes, it's like, bam, as soon as yeah. the opportunity is there, strike it and, and and maximize it. And if it's only nine minutes, so what? That's a good it's nine why, minutes. It's partly why – I also did it for – professionally, I did it for for that reason too. But it's why I moved to a planner that I can actually write in. Mm. And yes, it will take some time to do it. But you could easily do it, my brand new moms, while you're breastfeeding, while the baby's napping. And I do like calendar blocking. And I – I do it so that I can block in sometimes to do my work, but I block in my workout too. Mm-hmm. And I also block in, and I think this is key for my moms, especially who have you know more than one kid. Uh, you know, sometimes I go to the end of the week and I'm like, did I spend en- enough time with like each of them or all of them? Or and sometimes I'll do that in there too. Like, when can I block in like a certain amount of time for Landon, who's my oldest, who I feel like I get the least time with now, right? And how do I figure all that out? And I think. If you can actually block out your time and see two and then analyze it at the end of the week and see where am I wasting time, could I have fit in maybe three workouts this week instead of two because I have that one gap in there? That sounds overwhelming saying it out loud, but what I also love it is then I can check it off and uh-huh. be like, look oh, what I did nice. today. That feels good. <laughs> Uh, all right. You've shared a lot of great information, and I know you have a lot more that we can find online. How do we find you online? SarahHaley.com is my website. S A R A H A L E Y. SarahHaley.com. And are you like and then on, on social, the social media, media? I'm Sarah Haley Fit everywhere. Sarah Haley Fit. Oh, uh, so Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook Pinterest, YouTube. Snapchat, the delicious. Uh, no, I don't spend any time on Snapchat. Oh, you don't That's... snap. No, mm. I, I don't. don't I mean, you I'm gotta stop somewhere. And I'm about to say goodbye to Twitter. To be quite honest. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Final yeah, three. my audience isn't really hanging out on Twitter as much anymore. On Instagram, I'm telling you this for I don't usually say this, but I'm I'm Doctor Berlin, D O C T O R B E R L A N, and I, the reason I'm saying that is you've inspired me to go breathless. <laughs> it's been a, a long time, and when I do, I'm going to post a little video of it on Instagram. You know, when I last saw you, by the way, I have seen Doctor Berlin during my pregnancies too. That's how we met. You had just like. I think you just lost like a ton of weight. I juiced down like 120 yes. pounds. Yeah. But then it was a lot harder to do massage, I realized, because uh, I actually had to work. I couldn't just lean on people. <laughs> so now I'm glad I gained some of it back. Uh, thanks a million for being here and for sharing. We're going to find you online at sarahhaley.com. At home, thanks a ton for listening. And uh, guess what? If you have a topic you want to hear about and you want us to discuss, send me your suggestion at info at informedpregnancy.com. I got a whole lot of questions for you This kid's gonna test my will I got a lot to learn and my baby's too <laughs> This podcast is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high-quality shows for families just like yours. Download our free network app on Apple and Android and listen to your favorite episodes on the go.